This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hi, I'm so glad you're tuning in to Self Work for this particular episode. Last week was my 100th episode for self-work, and we had a blast. It's such an honor to believe that so many of you are tuning in and subscribing, that episode 101 is actually happening. So thank you so much. I'm a clinical psychologist. I've been doing what I do for 25 years, and that is doing therapy. I started self-work two years ago because I wanted to reach out to people who were already interested in psychological issues, perhaps, but were curious about what someone like me would have to say, but also to people who really may just be starting their journey with depression and anxiety, or they've never really considered mental health issues, but they love podcasts. So this would be an easy and convenient way for people to learn not only about therapy, but about mental health and mental wellness. So today we're going to be talking about dealing with pain and perfectionism during the holidays. I haven't heard any jingle bell music yet, but I'm sure it's just around the corner, probably right after Halloween. Are you one of those people who dread the leaves turning color? Or when you hear that the temperature is going to be below 50 degrees, do you wince and yearn for warmer weather? Did you have a loss during this year that you're still grieving and the thought of raising a glass to another year kind of makes you sick to your stomach? Are you looking back at last year and berating yourself for pounds not lost or goals not accomplished? Or are you so perfectionistic that each holiday season is sabotaged by having more things to do, more packages to wrap, more perfect meals to prepare, more perfect outfits for the kids, more deadlines that no matter what your workload, you have to get done. This kind of pain becomes much more evident in the holiday season. So we're going to touch on all of it. Seasonal affective disorder, grief, shame, and perfectionism, as well as Our listener email today, which is a regular feature of self-work. The listener is a woman who's getting divorced from someone who has gaslighted her. Basically, she says that she believes he has narcissistic personality disorder. And she realizes that after the divorce, she's not going to be able to protect the children from some of the very things that she sees him doing to them now. It's a very, very poignant email. So I'm looking forward to getting to it. So welcome to Self-Work. We're going to be talking about preparing yourself for the holidays in a way where you lean in to whatever pain you have, whatever struggle you have, and try to manage it to where it doesn't overwhelm you or sabotage any kind of joy you might be able to have during this season. As I said in the introduction, today we're going to be talking about the kinds of pain that can really sabotage any kind of joy you have in the holiday. We'll be talking about four, seasonal affective disorder, grief, shame, and perfectionism. For those of you who have listened, you know that I am passionate about what I term perfectly hidden depression, so we'll get to that. But first, let's talk about seasonal affective disorder. The research on SAD actually offers different outcomes. Several studies show that women may experience downtimes during winter months more than men, and that people who are living somewhere where they didn't grow up have more trouble. Isn't that interesting? Almost as if your struggle is with not growing up around familiar seasonal components. There's also the idea that maybe SAD is due to living farther away from the equator, which affects sunlight. Now, there are some recent studies that kind of debunk that whole idea. Basically, the studies kind of said, well, if the countries that have more sunlight have less depression, then that would tend to support that theory. But that's not what they found at all. In fact, the hours of light during the day or during the 24-hour period had nothing to do with reported depression rates internationally. Yet there are many, many people who feel like 
seasonal affective disorder is a reality. In fact, they'll swear they get the winter blues. It is interesting that I've also worked with patients who have gotten a kind of seasonal depression during the warmer months, but more people definitely have it in the winter months. You know, whether it can be statistically proven or not, whether it has something to do with the holiday season occurring during the winter, or whether it's about how close you are to the sun, if it's in your experience, if you detect every year that it's harder for you to function when it's cold and murky, then how do you help yourself? Most of us can't afford winter homes or vacations to Tahiti, so what do you do? Exercise, of course, is always very, very helpful with seasonal affective disorder, as is making sure you stay in touch with your support group. Try not to isolate. And there are light therapies. This is basically a special box that emits the kind of light that is believed to affect someone's circadian rhythm and increase melatonin, which is important in the sleep-wake cycle. Several studies have shown that light therapy was very effective, especially when compared with a group who believed they were getting the same treatment, but were not. This is really exciting news if you don't like taking medication or you failed medication treatment. I know several people who have lights at their workstations and turn them on just enough to where they get the kind of help they need. And if you look on Amazon for light boxes, you'll find several different varieties ranging from around $40 to over $200. Also, the Mayo Clinic suggests that you check especially with your eye doctor before you choose this route. So if you have seasonal affective disorder and that tends to sabotage the whole experience of the holidays for you, then exercise, light therapy, staying with your support group and not isolating, even though... It's harder to find the energy to do things. It's really important. Also, if you're on medication, it's not a good idea to get off medication. If you have seasonal affective disorder, you don't want to get off of it in the winter. You already know that it's going to be a tougher time for you. But also, with the new year and the celebrating of a new year can come the pain of shame. It's a time that many of us assess where we've been and where we're going. What goals did we meet last year and what are the directions we'd like to move in the next? But if you focus solely on what didn't happen this past year, again, the 20 pounds you didn't lose, the exercise you didn't get, the vacation with the kids you didn't take, and let that disappointment be your entire focus, those thoughts can easily lead to paralyzing shame or just bitterness, which can be really damaging. What is much more helpful is to be compassionate with yourself and try to understand what undermined your goals. I, for one, did not lose the weight that I gained last holiday season. I'm sitting and writing a book, and that's not very conducive to (laughs) losing a lot of weight. But you know what? I'm proud of where the book is going. So what I suggest doing is trying to prioritize The things that didn't get done, the things that weren't accomplished, were probably not priorities. So what did you accomplish? What did you learn? What did you experience that was important to you? And as far as those thoughts of shame, a question I recommend when your thoughts are turning toward just beating yourself up over the head is, is what I'm feeling helpful in this moment? Is it serving a positive purpose? If not, then distract yourself or try to free your mind from obsessing about what was not. Think what would be helpful right now. What would be helpful, most likely, is for me to make a list, even if it's short, of what I learned or what I experienced or how I grew in 2018. That can be very helpful and a good way to start 2019. Then, of course, there's the pain of grief. With the holidays come the stress of family and connection. And if you've experienced actual loss or trauma during that year, maybe you were diagnosed with an illness that was unexpected and unwelcome. Maybe you lost a beloved family member. Maybe you got a divorce. Maybe a friendship ended. Maybe you didn't get into the school you wanted to get in. Maybe your job is just chronically unsatisfying. The sadness you can feel can be very real. It's not the blues as in seasonal affective disorder, 
but a deep sense of loss or disappointment. My message is you don't have to pretend during the holidays not to feel it. Most of us don't want to be the person that everyone realizes is unhappy or is in a bad spot. But the people who really care about you are knowing that your grieving is not going to go away simply because it's, quote-unquote, the holidays. In fact, memories of other happier times can weigh very heavy in your mind and heart. I heard someone say last year she'd lost a family member very suddenly. I don't want to be a drag to anyone. I'm afraid I'll cry or not be able to be a part of things. What I told her was I reminded her how she would feel if someone else was in her spot, that she would want them to grieve. So allow yourself to work through whatever grief you have. I know what it feels like, and I've said this on other podcasts, but both my parents died one week apart the week before Christmas in 2007. And I remember how tough it was, especially in 2008. Not that 2007 wasn't very hard, but 2008 was really, really difficult. So it was important for me to allow myself to feel whatever I was feeling and allow others to help me. So please give yourself the same permission. And now that brings up the pain of perfectionism. Perfectly hidden depression is my term for a syndrome of characteristics that tend to fit together or can be found together, like a very shaming critical voice, over-responsibility, discounting your own pain, being a great friend to others but nobody knowing you, counting your blessings constantly, worrying and needing to be in control, often being very successful professionally but feeling very empty on a personal level. So what does perfectly hidden depression look like at the holidays? Your house could be the featured story in a design magazine, flocked in greenery and ribbons from floor to ceiling, the sugary smell of Christmas cookies in the air. The gifts could be wrapped in matching paper and piled up under a 12-foot Christmas tree loaded with special ornaments. The kids' outfits for church are ready to go. Donations to charities have been given. Gifts have been picked out, not just for friends, but for anyone who might drop by. Remember, if they bring a gift to you, you have to be perfect and give them one, right? It's another perfectly hidden holiday. Now, someone with PhD may feel good about the accomplishment of these things. There's even a kind of solace or pride that your life and your family's life seems full. You like being a giver, someone who looks out for others, and yet there's something missing. Joy is missing. The tremendous effort, the worry that things won't get done, the need for everything to be perfect, drowns out any true joy. I can remember my mother, who was extremely perfectionistic. She would fix the Christmas dining table weeks before the actual day. We weren't allowed in there, by the way. And she would constantly check it and recheck it. Now, some of that was her obsessive compulsive disorder, but it was also her perfectionism. With perfectly hidden depression, you can't just be in the present. You're playing a role. Instead of being who you are, you'll be the hostess, the son-in-law, Andrea's mom, or Jeff's boss. Instead of being those things and allowing whatever happens to happen, you'll try to intentionally craft those roles. The perfect hostess the perfect son-in-law, the perfect parent, or the perfect boss. Joy will only arrive as some muted version of itself as you watch yourself play out your duties. And that's what life can become. One duty after another duty after another duty. But the good news about perfectly hidden depression is that you can stop. It takes work. But I ask you to check out my podcast on Perfectly Hidden Depression, beginning with Episodes 3 and 4, and they're interspersed completely throughout, because you can breathe in the moment. You can decide to be present. You can realize that your value is not all about what you perform or accomplish. You can learn how to connect with your pain, because working through it can bring tremendous relief. I promise, joy is waiting for you around the corner.
Our listener email today starts out with quite the lovely compliment. Thank you for your enlightening podcast and for opening each episode with that hauntingly beautiful cello medley. Now, I used to be a professional musician, so I picked that music out very carefully, and I also like it a lot. I don't like a lot of podcast intro music, so it's kind of frenetic sounding to me. So that's the first time anybody's ever said anything about the music that made me feel good. Okay, back to her email. My writing to you is a little bit about my husband's ongoing negative attitude towards me, but more about how that attitude is now gradually directed at our two children, ages 10 and 4. Over the years, my children have seen many times the way my husband treats me with hostility. His gestures, bullying, mocking, and more subtly gaslighting, all of those qualify as emotional abuse, according to my therapist. I only recently learned that there was something called gaslighting. My husband and I are currently in the process of divorce. I plan to have a special talk with my children about this change once we reach an agreement on parenting schedule after divorce. My biggest concern now is that my husband may very possibly continue to gaslight our children, if nothing else. For example, he's already been habitually questioning my daughter's memory. It happens all the time. My daughter might ask something like, hey, what are we going to do today? We have no plans. No one has told her if there is one. But my husband replies, you don't remember? I already told you we might go to the playground, remember? My husband is actually the forgetful one in the family. But still, he says this to our daughter. Or he tells our son when I ask him to do his homework assignment, what your mother is doing is now called child abuse. You don't believe me? Your mother can't make you do something if you don't want to do it. We are still living in the same house until the divorce is final. I try hard to avoid getting into arguments with my soon-to-be ex. I find other opportunities to tell my daughter that her memory is just fine. I tell my son that completing his high school assignment is also about learning how to be responsible, and I'm not asking him to do his assignments for me. But after the divorce, during their father's parenting time, I can't know everything or anything that happens that can potentially mislead them. I'm afraid if my children are being undermined by their father for something long enough, they might just accept his subjective opinion of them to be true. What advice do you have for me as a parent of young children during this time of family transition, given my husband's personality issue? I have reached out to a child psychologist to meet with our children. The psychologist would first need the father's acknowledgement in order for our children to receive counseling, but my husband has not yet responded to that question request. Your time and thoughts are greatly appreciated. Wow, this woman is in a tough, tough position. And that's what I say to her. You're in a tough position and one that I've seen many people in, sadly. The hardest part of any divorce is knowing that you're no longer going to be a present buffer for the bad behavior of your ex. Unless there are issues that require actual supervised visitation, You're faced with loading them in his or her car and not knowing what's really happening to them while they're not with you. There's one caveat about divorce. Very few people rise to the occasion just for the kids. Most divorces mimic the marriages they come from. If your ex has been manipulative, he'll continue to be. If he's gaslighted you and now them, he'll keep on. Some because he knows it will get to you, but some because of his own disorder. Let's talk a little bit about what gaslighting is. Gaslighting is a technique that's used by some people to undermine someone's sense of their own reality, their gut instinct, but also just things that they remember. It's done in order to foster dependence on you, to foster confusion, to make you feel bad about yourself, to question yourself all the time. It's a very, very damaging kind of manipulation and one that a lot of people with narcissistic personality disorder tend to use. So that's what gaslighting is. Back to my email. Your children are still young, but as they age, and yet even now, I'd recommend doing your best to empower them to speak up. Let them know that you believe their reality. Suggest that they tell their dad when something he says or does doesn't feel good. This is very hard because most children want to please their parents and they'll want to please him. It's more than difficult to watch your children have to learn for themselves 
how manipulative a parent can be. And so you'll watch and you'll guide and you'll try not to talk bad about the parent, except you can point out, wow, it feels like what dad said really bothered you or seemed to make you sad or afraid. Remember now, if he's saying those things in your presence, he's likely saying them to hurt you or get a rise out of you. You might want to read Disarming the Narcissist, a good book on how to stay out of a battle with someone with that disorder. And I'll have that link in the show notes. Also, I'm not sure where you live, but in the U.S., as long as the two of you aren't divorced yet and you both still have custody, only one of you has to agree to therapy. That's in Arkansas, at least. Other states could be different. I hope you're talking with your attorney very practically about your future with your ex and not painting a rosier picture than it is, because things can be written into the divorce decree that are protective, especially if you fear that hurtful things are happening with your children. You know, after I wrote this email, I also thought it takes a long time for someone who's lived with someone with narcissistic personality disorder to begin to trust themselves. So my guess is that this listener will also be on that journey. If you've recognized it and actually are divorcing him, then you're on your way. But learning, again, to trust your judgment, to have confidence in yourself, can be quite a long battle. Good luck to you. So I hope you enjoyed episode 101. Please email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com confidentially, and I will answer you. If you don't want your question used on the broadcast, then simply tell me that, and I won't do it. But I love getting to know you, what you're facing in your own life, and how perhaps I can be helpful. There are plenty of ways of connecting more with me. I have a new Facebook group. It's facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. It's mostly women. In fact, I think I have like half a dozen men, but men are invited. You can also subscribe at drmargaretrutherford.com and get my weekly newsletter with not only my podcast, but a blog post. Of course, you can subscribe wherever you listen, Stitcher, Spreaker, Podbean, iTunes, and I would so be grateful for a rating or review. Your reviews, especially your written reviews, let me know specifically the things that you like or you don't like. iTunes is the way many, many, many people listen, so leaving one there is especially appreciated. Thank you so much again. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work. <laughs>